Okay, well, we may have some people that are still joining us, but let's make sure that we make good use of the time that we have here together. So I would like to welcome everybody to the spring 2022 orientation uh, student panel that we have here uh, at the graduate school. Um, you know, I was I was ready to say ordinarily we'd be excited to be greeting you in the ballroom or you know over at the room you know of a student union, um, but this is sort of getting to be old hat at this point doing these online and um, you know I'm not I don't well, I'll be curious to see if we ever go back because it's really nice to be able to have people coming in from all over the place that might not have ordinarily ordinarily been able to make it to stores, but welcome nonetheless. We're happy to have you here as a student. And we're happy to hear have you here at our presentation. So my name is Karen Bresciano. I'm assistant dean of the graduate school. And what we're hoping that we're going to do today is have um, a brief introduction from our dean, and then we'll move right into a panel. Um, uh, we have some really fantastic graduate students that are coming from uh, lots of different places and programs to talk with us about a bit about their experience. Um, we have some questions that we are had set up to ask because they're the questions that always get asked when we do these panels. And then if anybody has any questions that you would like to ask. You can put them in the chat and just um, address it to all panelists, and then we'll make sure that we get to as many of those as possible during our time together. So, uh, Ken, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Karen. And let me second Karen's welcome to everybody who's here. It's wonderful to see you virtually, if not in person, and it's wonderful to welcome you to the University of Connecticut. Graduate students are the core of a great university, and so you are vital to the, to UConn's success, and we're, we're delighted to have you here. I, I do have to say a few words in that this is another unusual semester, which is in that this one, we're starting with all instruction remote for the first two weeks, and we anticipate returning to in-person instruction after that. So the 31st, either the 31st of January or the 1st of February. We hope that that will happen, and, but our first priority is to keep you and everyone else on in, as part of the Yukon community safe. I want to say, I don't want to take a lot of time here because the main reason we're here is to listen to your fellow graduate students uh, about their experience and help to help you be successful. I just want to emphasize how important and how useful it is for you to hear from them and to reach out to your fellow graduate students, both new and those who've been here for a while, for insight and perspective because graduates school is different from under being an undergraduate and it can be challenging in many ways and those those who have gone before you have figured out how some of the obstacles that they faced and will have will have ideas about how to circuit to overcome those obstacles that will be very valuable to you they will have experienced the yukon in a way that karen and i and other members of the staff or faculty have not because they've experienced it as students um, as, and in as particular as graduate students. And so it is very important for your success, not only to focus on your academic work and your study and your research, but also to focus on building a community that's close to you that can support you through the challenges of graduate school. Because graduate school is simultaneously a really exciting uh, and wonderful time where you have a chance to learn and explore all sorts of new things, but it's also a very challenging time. And so it's very important to have that support network available to you. And of course, we at the Graduate School are always here to help and to support you in any way we can. So if you're on campus, feel free to stop by anytime, second floor of Wetton, just to say hi, or if you wanna talk a bit more about some challenge you're facing or some opportunity you're considering, do that as well. So without any further ado, I'll turn it back over to Karen and the panel. Thank you, Ken. Um, I would like to make sure to mention that our session today is being recorded. Uh, we also have um, uh, in interpreters that are interpreting for us today, as well as live captioners. Um, information about that has been put in the chat. If you have any questions, please make sure to be in touch with us um, in, through the chat. Um, what I did is put it on the large grid, so that way we can see all the panelists and they can see the interpreters at the same time. So hopefully that works for you. If I can ask the panelists to all um, turn on their cameras at this point, that would be great. Um, so there are several different people that work at the graduate school who can be um, helpful to you at any given time. Um, so me as the assistant dean, um, Cinnamon Adams is the director of graduate student and postdoctoral support. Stuart Duncan is the director of programs, uh, programming and diversity recruitment. 
Megan Petza, the Director of Graduate Student Administration. Um, Gia is our grad assistant um, who has been thankfully putting together this wonderful program today. And Karina Vital is another one of our graduate assistants. So if, um, if I can just get right into the student panel portion, what I'd like to ask first is for each of our panelists to go ahead and introduce yourself just in the order that we have it in, the, in our script. So um, Olive, do you wanna go first? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Alev. I am in STORS campus. I am in the behavioral neuroscience department. This is my second year. I came with a master's, so I'm now doing my PhD here, and I'm very excited to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi? Sure, uh, I can jump in. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Kaidi Chen. Um, I'm currently a third year PhD student in, a, in, a, in the applied and linguistics. In Applied Linguistics and Discourse Studies program is in the Department of uh, uh, Literatures, Cultures and Languages. Um, I also came in with a master with me uh, before uh, um, before enrolled in this PhD program. So, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Great. Thank you. Brianna. Hi, my name is Brianna. I am currently getting my master's of social work um, on the Hartford campus. Thank you and Mitch. Hi, I'm Mitch Rary. I'm a first year, a part time MBA student um, at uh, the Waterbury campus. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So why don't we jump right in and, and ask of you, um, I mean, all of you have been certainly college students before you got to the University of Connecticut, uh, maybe only as an undergrad, maybe you had a grad program before, like others have mentioned. What surprised you the most about going from your undergrad experience into your grad experience? And if you had an other grad experience, what surprised you most about your experience at UConn so far? Anybody want to start? Well, I'll just say, uh, you know, it's great to, uh, as a grad student, to go in and see a lot of students uh, very interested in class, very engaged. And um, they're also, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot more connected with your, your classmates. Uh, in the graduate school. Thanks, Mitch. I did my undergrad at UConn. So um, what was very different for me was um, not just class size, but all of our common interests. So going from an undergrad program that can be very broad to um, finding where you want to be and finding like-minded people has been not only beneficial in learning from everyone around you, but also brings for great discourse in classes. Great, thank you. Mm, and also, one thing to add is um, maybe just my personal experience. Um, being in a graduate program, I mean, the lifestyle has changed a bit because in the undergrads, you you live with, with everybody, usually in residential halls, but mm -hmm. one, I think not many students really in live on campus, but there were some, but not that many. Most of the graduate students live off campus. So I I mean, the lifestyle has changed a bit. You will have a more like independent lifestyle. And uh, if you really need to like uh, create some social networkings and the more time you will be focused on your research. And it also in factor that may like give you less time to really socialize with people. And given the current times, it's also the pandemic. So, yeah. so yeah, you have to, you have to be in the relatively isolated situation compared to being an undergrad. So, well, just my personal like perspective. I think that's pretty common. I think that for graduate students find themselves needing to be much more intentional about finding social opportunities, specifically if they're looking to have ones outside of the folks that are in their department, um, which I recommend. Alib, do you have anything that you wanted to add? No, mm, no not them. Okay. Um, so what do you think has been the greatest challenge so far in your graduate school studies? And I can also temper that with what's been your greatest opportunity. I can start with that. Okay. Um, work life balance was, I think, one of the very like challenging things in this regard, because like one hand you love what you do and one hand it's technically it's your job to do. Um, so what I started to do when I first started my master's and also in my PhD is 
writing down almost every day or every week what I do. So at the end of the week, I know how much time I dedicated to my own research, my own coursework or my TA ship things. So it kind of helps you how much you actually work during your day or during your week. So it's, it's very important to have a work life balance. So I'm just going to say recommend that to begin with. That's key. Brianna. Um, I also found it very difficult. I am also a mom to a toddler um, and work full time. So finding not just work life balance, but managing my time well so that I can fit everything I need to fit in. So at the beginning of every semester, I have taken all of the syllabus from all my classes, laid them out so I know ahead of time and kind of plan ideally weekly what I need to get done. Um, but, you know, you do have to look ahead and you do have to make sure when you are taking multiple classes at the same time, you don't get caught up um, in something that may be overwhelming, um, especially because for myself, having a family, unexpected things happen. And so just taking that into account with your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Heidi? Yeah, and in terms of the balance, uh, not only life work balance, but just for the work, you have to balance. Because I think for most graduate students, you not only need to do your own research, but also you need to teach. So how to balance your time that like you spend on teaching and on your research? And I think it really depends on which year and which program that, that you're in, the percentage of your like graduate assistantship. Some of them are like 50, 50%, like 50% uh, to be a research assistant. Some of them are 50% to be a teaching assistant. And some of them, if I think in most of the scenarios, if you're more advanced, like fourth, third year, then most of the time, um, and which I think is more ideal because you can more focus on your research. And so 100% will be a research assistantship that will be ideal. But I think in the first or second year, you have to spend more time like teaching courses or, or being a teaching assistant. And there's a lot of homework that, that you need to grade and um, maybe a hundred students in your class and you have to grade all of them. <laughs> so it's really an issue that um, how that you can balance your work and I mean, balance your different kinds of work, like teaching and mm -hmm. research. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, whenever people talk about work life balance, um, I always feel like I, I need to mention um, that, that phrase, to be honest with you, is a, makes me a little bit cringy because it sort of gives the impression that like it's all on you, that, you know, if you just did it right, you'd be able to do everything. Um, and sometimes I feel like what really we need to reframe that and think that sometimes there are things that need to be left off the scale. You know, so we need to figure out what are the priorities, what needs to be done. Um, but maybe when you're in, you know, the third year of your PhD program, it's not the time to train for a marathon. Um, you know, it could be that it is. Maybe that's the way that you totally get your stress relief, and that's something that you can work into your schedule. Um, but the, for most of us, there are things that we need to leave off the scale for a little while. Um, but setting those priorities and knowing where you're going to spend your time the most is is um, is can be can be challenging. Um, and I just, I, so I want people to know that it's not just, if, if you're having a hard time balancing it all, it's not because you're doing anything wrong generally sometimes, it's just because there's not enough room on the scale. Uh, go ahead, Sorry. Brianna. Um, also finding your support, um, who you can support, whether it be within your program, within the graduate school itself, or your own personal social supports. Um, finding someone who you can turn to if it is overwhelming and, or can help you take something off your scale somehow um, has been really beneficial to find for myself. That's great. It's good advice. Yeah, to totally agree, uh, Brianna. Um, you know, I have, I have four kids myself, um, rely a lot on my wife and family nearby to help out when I'm not uh, at home. So I kind of have, I have several buckets, right? Just like you, you have your family and your children and you have school, I have work full time and then then there's the other bucket, right? That Karen was talking about, which is like, I want to trend for a marathon or any of that kind of stuff that I try to fit on there too. So it's it's a lot of balance. And I think planning really helps a lot with that. Uh, at the start of the semester, at least like, I'm hoping it's going to help me this next semester. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Because we have to find ways to be healthy, but we also know that graduate school isn't forever. Uh, so. So what about opportunities? Was there anything that um, you've been able to experience since you got here that you were thinking, oh my gosh, I never would have had an opportunity to do this if I had not decided to go to graduate school?
this is an unexpected question to everybody. <laughs> Maybe there's not an answer for that right now. That's okay. Well, let me switch it up a little bit. Um, and if you have an answer for that later, when, if it, after it percolates, feel free to go back to it. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about the importance of having some balance. And for some people, that balance is getting involved on campus in some way. Um, so it might be uh, within your department uh, in a student organization within your department, or maybe for some people, it's really important to get involved outside of your department. So can you speak to us a little bit about how you have decided to get involved on campus or off campus? Uh, what do you do with your time that's not strictly speaking your academic focus? I can start with that. Um, I used to teach and do dance um, when I was an um, undergrad. So when I came here, I was like, since I'm in grad school, I should be able to have time to do my hobby. So I am now in a part of the ballroom society at UConn. So I think in a way, yes, we of course come to the campus, we teach, we go to the lab, whatever, but like we should also have our life and our hobbies and that those can be linked to the campus. So for me, it was like going to the ballroom and dancing at least once a week is kind of helping me in that sense. So I, I will definitely recommend that, like go back to your lovely hobbies and just, it's nice to socialize too, so. That's great, thank you. Anyone else like to share? So, uh, I'm Oh, yeah, Brianna, yeah, you, 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 you go ahead. So, unfortunately, since I've started graduate school, um, almost all my classes have been online. Um, so I haven't actually even been to the Harvard campus yet. Um, so that's been kind of surprising. Um, but so I haven't also been able to get as involved as I was in undergrad activities. Um, but. Personally, I am also a coach um, in the area for softball for young girls, and that's always been something that's been near and dear to me um, and something that I've continued on um, even now that I have a family of my own. That's great. Heidi? Um, for my case, um, um, I, I'm, I'm a member of the tennis club. So as uh, uh, is that, uh, Alvi, um, as suggested, yeah, it's very, very important to keep at least one hobby with you. That's very important. You cannot put all of the eggs in just one basket because it's very normal that you will fail <laughs> in lots of cases in graduate school, but everyone is like this, so you're not alone. So at least uh, put, um, do not put all the emphasis uh, just on your um, an academic work. So have some something outside there, like a hobby. So it's very important. So go to gym and uh, mental work and your physical work um, are both important. So in lots of cases, graduate school, they have trained me how to develop of, 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 um, of our mentality. But in lots of cases, we're not trained to really develop a body. So it's very important to keep uh, yourself healthy. So go to gym, at least to keep a hobby with you. That's very important. Good advice. So I'm going to jump topics a bit and um, and ask you to speak to us a bit about your experience with your advisor. Um, that can be a really important relationship um, for all of us, but particularly for PhD students. Um, can we talk a little bit about? Can you speak to us a little bit about how you have developed um, your relationship with your advisor? Um, what went well, uh, you know, what are the things that you would recommend for somebody as they're beginning their um, start beginning a relationship with their advisor? So I actually got lucky. I knew my advisor before she was my advisor, um, but we did build a relationship based off of common interests and um, being a social work student, it is um, a very small community. Um, so having her as a professor as well um, helped her know me in an academic sense. And then also being able um, to know my goals and being able to communicate that with her has helped us build a relationship. That's great. For my case, I'm um, similar to Brianna. I knew my professor before coming here, and, and um, 
and I know he's a very, very good person. That's a very important factor to make me make a decision uh, that I will come here. So I think it's very important. So not only for your academic interest, but uh, about the personality, because you have to be, you have to work together, like in the PhD program, five or f five or six years in a master two or three years. Then so it's very important that you're working with the people that you can get really get along with. Um, <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> make the relation and, and have a professional relationship and also be friendly, <clears throat> but also one important and one important thing to keep in mind is do not overwork. It's very normal <laughs> to overwork in graduate school. Um, so if you really feel that it's overwhelming, um, please uh, communicate with your supervisor and um, to let him or her and like know the real situation is if you really cannot handle within this week it's okay it's not the end of the world it's okay to postpone a bit and then but just to let your supervisor know what your real situation is and uh, yeah so be nice to yourself it's very important in graduate school because mm -hmm. it's usually uh, we have to overwork a bit and communicate i heard and i saw you i saw you nodding Alev. Yes, I was just going to add something little to that. Um, as I, I agree with everything, I just want to add that. Um, we should be able to, or you should, you shouldn't be feeling alone in the whole grad school process. So you should have a very secure and be able to talk with that person relationship in your whole grad life, because like. The big part of being a grad school, being in, in, the, in a part of the grad school is like, you are, you should be being advised to what to do, how to do things. So if you ever feel alone, you should speak to your super advisor and like solve what is the issue with that communication. I'm just gonna. Great. I was just, um, someone messaged me in a private chat and I was saying a skill that I had to develop, which I, on a personal level was hard for me, was reaching out for help whether that's to my advisor or to someone personally um it's a it's a large you're taking on a large load a lot of the time and being able to ask for help is definitely a skill and being able to communicate that to someone appropriately finding that person can be your advisor or someone else but um finding that person is important it's good advice mitch anything you wanted to add no pressure yeah, you know, my my uh, advisor so far has been great. It's evident that he's been been uh, helping students, uh, you know, find their way through the first uh, semester or so of grad school for a long time. Um, been great and very reliable. Um, and uh, I have been shy to ask him for questions when I, I don't which way, know which way to turn. So not phase for me. That's great. So what I was hearing is um that uh, knowing your advisor um professionally and, and you know maybe even personally having um, communication with them is important um i was hearing uh, describing what your goals are to make sure that both of you know what your goals are because your advisor won't necessarily know that if you don't talk with them about it um same with your challenges um I, we, we know that sometimes uh, students are af afraid to talk to their faculty about what their challenges are because they think that it seems like they're admitting fault, um, but faculty are human too, and they had a tough time and they had challenges in uh, their grad school experience as well, and they won't know that you need support if you don't ask for it. Um, so thank you for the advice that you all just gave. Also one thing to add very specific advice, so it's okay to switch advisor. So if because things change if you find that your research interest has changed when you, after you're taking many courses it's okay so communication is very important um and uh, i think most supervisors if they're good people they they won't be pissed off so it's okay so uh, communication is very important and uh, um and change of interest or like uh, you think someone else is a is a is a more um is a more fit for you not only in like personality but also in research interest it's okay to switch thank hey, you Anna, actually if i could just build on that because that, that, that's an excellent piece of advice i did it myself when i was a p graduate student i found that the my interest developed in a way that the person i was initially working with was not not the right advisor the other thing i just wanted to add i think it's very important for everyone to keep in mind 
is that you is that just because you have one person who is your advisor, you can also seek out other faculty or staff as mentors for advice. So you don't have to depend just on the person who is your advisor. And in fact, I would advise you not to because your advisor will have a particular set of experiences and is very highly qualified in some ways, but may not know how to advise you in some other ways because their personal experience is different from yours. Thank you for that, Kent. Any other thoughts on this topic? And one thing to add on that is we can have co-advisors as I put in the chat. And for my case, um, I have a co-advisor from another department and uh, is from my sec the end of uh, the second semester of my second year. So I uh, like to combine the interests from different departments. So this is also a way that to go. It's great. So I some a couple of you have mentioned having children. Um, what advice would either of you have for folks that are incoming graduate students that have families, which doesn't have to be just children, right? For some folks, there are other people, people that they're coming with that are part of their family units. Well, uh, you know, have to uh, have to help your uh, your spouse or you know whomever is helping you out when you're not around. When you have to go to class, um, make sure you're. Um, Doing some dishes or uh, paying paying back uh, when you can. Um, I feel like you know when my classes tend to some is it let us out a little bit early for the MBA course, um, or whatever. If it's lousy weather, but I know I'm, if I'm there late and it's ten o'clock. Um, you know my my wife is doing everything for four kids until I get back. So it's it's a big ask. I I know that. Um, so just, just be appreciative. <laughs> and just kind of, you know, try to again, I think for me, it just comes down to planning and understanding what uh, what uh, what burden you're or the other person is dealing with or whoever you're whoever's helping you is going to have to work through. Try to do the best you can for them while you're available because you, you you do a couple of, uh, you know, balls in the air with uh, with grad. So for sure. I see you nodding your head, Brianna. Yeah. Um... Pretty much just reiterating what Mitch said, I just being grateful, um, helping when you can, and the planning has been huge. Um, just outlining what has to be done um, in the home with the children and with ourselves and just planning for it. Um, I feel like I, at this point, could probably have a master's in time management just based on all the balls that our family has in the air. Um, so just being very, um, thoughtful about that process and about whoever is your support network, um, and thanking them and just being there as much as you can. And that it is only a limited time. It's not going to last forever. And just keeping that in mind as you can, because it can feel like a lot sometimes, but it's only a lot for a little bit. Yeah. Right. And, and also, you know, um. We have a lot of uh, group projects and stuff like that that requires coordination outside of just your your set class schedule. So when it comes down to meeting with group members and stuff, uh, other people who have who have different circumstances than than you do, and trying to coordinate that, what time has worked for them, what time has worked for you, you know, you and I, Brianna, we're thinking in the back of our minds, you know, what's worked for my kids, right? Um, so it's just it's just a lot, it's a lot of planning, um, and then it's also kind of lets you. Um, be considerate of who you're working with in your class because everybody's got different circumstances in grad school. So, thank you. Um, does anybody or any of our panelists have um, experience in, in the union? Are you in, who's a GA? Does anybody like, there? Because there is within the um, for folks who have a GA experience, there is um, some childcare reimbursement through the union. Um, so if folks that are coming in, if you're coming in with with children, that way you're going to be using child care and you have a GA, just be aware of that because that's something that can be really helpful to the to the family. Um, and, and again, you probably saw it already in the chat, but if anybody has any questions about anything, feel free to throw it into the chat and um, send it to all panelists and we'll do our best to answer those questions. Um, I heard uh, Brianna, you said something about your master's degree in time management, so no pressure and uh, in how you want to do this, but I'm more curious if each of us can talk about it. What is 1 piece of advice that you would give to uh, 1st year graduate students 
or maybe even something that you wish that you had known before you started? I have a very specific advice. It's about the grades of your courses. Just get through it. Don't think that is that important because you're not an undergrad as, anymore, and uh, nobody will care that much about、um, whether you get ninety or eighty. So it's just important that you really learn that what you really want to learn and that can serve your research or teaching or all aspect or even that you like. For example, you want. You don't want to be in academia. I'm more speaking to the doctoral program. If you don't want to be in academia, or you have some other interest that you want to develop, it's okay um, um, to take courses, but、uh, just not for the sake of the the grades, because、uh, uh, the mo most important thing is to get through it. Not、um, and and then you will have more time to really develop your interest and to really make use of the courses, not for the purpose of taking courses. So yeah, get through it is very important. Okay. I think it has been said, but really, really don't forget to take a break. You don't want to burn out yourself in your second year of grad school. It's not like a sprint; it's a marathon. It's, not, it's like a long marathon. Don't forget to take breaks. Good advice. I think you'll find that in the graduate program, professors are more human. They're more colleagues that help you learn,、um, and you can develop some more relationships with them, which can help you、um, have more communication. And it seems to be a little more of a Working together than learning from them, so you're all learning together. At least has been my experience in my program. Yeah, that seems to be a pretty common piece of feedback that I hear from graduate students on these panels is when they talk about what's the difference between undergrad and grad. Is that in undergrad they felt like they were sort of like a vessel for knowledge,、um, you know, they were soaking it up. And then they get here, and whether they are prepared for it or not, they're like, "Oh wait, <laughs> now I'm involved in creating this knowledge." And it's like a whole mind shift、um, to to think about things in a different way. Was that was that a, a, an experience that was that something that you all shared? It almost feels like you're now also in charge of what you learn,、um, which puts the onus back on you, but also、um, kind of makes. It's a little freeing in the world of academia for me,、um, knowing that I can go left or go right, and no one's telling me which way to go, but both ways could be correct, I guess, in a way of thinking.、Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that front? So, okay, so there's a question that came in from.、Um, From folks that says, I don't know, maybe maybe Kent, you want to be be prepared to hear this one too.、Um, I'm interested in working in industry,、um, consulting, R and D, manufacturing, process design, but I'm open to teaching after a few years. What would be my best options for remaining remaining competitive for academia while in industry? Any thoughts on that? Well, the first thing I'll say is we did a survey a few years ago, looking at the career outcomes specifically of PhD students. So we don't have this for master students, but for PhD students, and we did see quite a few whose first job was in some form of government or industry employment, and then they later moved into a tenure track faculty position. I think the key、um, to being Being mobile in that way to starting an industry and then moving into academics is, while you're in the、uh, some kind of industry or non-academic position, to continue to be engaged with the academic community you want to be part of. That means perhaps going to their professional meetings annually,、uh, perhaps presenting papers at those me professional meetings, and continuing to publish in the kinds of venues. That you would publish in if you if you were、um, an academic in that community. I think 
that most search committees will recognize that the the rate of publication and the the exact venues in which you publish might be somewhat different as a result of being an in industry rather than academics but they are going to expect some level of engagement and then depending on the field your experience in industry could actually be a real asset because it will bring experiences that those of us who went straight through college into graduate school to professorships just don't have. You know, which makes me think about the thinking about career and using the um, Center for Career Development all through your experience and not waiting until you just want to find a job um, because uh, Kay Gruder is our superstar over at career. Um, who focuses on specifically graduate students and and she will say over and over again um, to, that she really wants to see people throughout their career during the time that they're here to be thinking about what you want to do next um, and one of the things that we know is that our graduate students um, that there's some there's career diversity and, and I, i'm thinking a little bit about the phd students at this point um, that not everybody who wants to go into a phd program intends to be a faculty member and um, and so having somebody who has had some industry experience in the at professorship later will be helpful to those people um, because when you are um, trying to advise people your your students on different uh, opportunities it's hard when you don't know anything about working in industry so having somebody in the department that has that could really be an asset like Kent mentioned any thoughts from anybody in the on the panel about what Kent has shared and the question that somebody asked. Maybe I can add um, from a very specific uh, disciplinary perspective, and I work in psych. I, I'm 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 working linguistics, more specifically psycholinguistic and speech perception. And uh, for people in linguistic who finally go to industry, are those people who have taken lots of courses in programming? <laughs> so finally, they end up with a job like natural language processing. Uh, although we will do some, uh, we will do some on that and uh, with some work on data analysis, but usually, of course, our programming skills are not that good uh, as uh, those people in, in computer science. So those people who have a very clear intention that they have the plan to go to industry usually will take more courses in programming. So this is a very special case in my field. So mm -hmm. just, um, I think it's more like discipline and field and program dependent. So for like the your like your plan for either being in academia or industry. Yeah. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Another question that came in is how can I plan my program so that I graduate as quickly as possible? Anybody have thoughts on that? I know it's very specific to my program. Um, you cannot typically. <laughs> um, I was able to get, um, I did apply to do in my program called the summer block. Um, it is an accelerated portion for your final year of internship. Um, I was only able to do that by showing um, that I had the ability in multiple areas to complete that successfully. Um, I still don't know if I received it, but I did apply for it. Um, otherwise, that would be the only way specifically in my program to graduate early. But I know in a lot of programs, <laughs> um, you have very set standards for credits and hours. And um, I mean, someone else with a more structured program, not that mine isn't, but I was able to look at one piece of mine and possibly do it. Um, but I know mostly there's not a chance to do that. Okay. Yeah, some of them are pretty structured. Others really, really not. So <laughs> anybody else have any thoughts or advice on that? I can just add, like, you can program your classworks and whatever, but at the end of the day, you are going to do the research, do the experiment and write the dissertation and for instance, I'm working with rats, like if the experiments are not going to work, I have to adjust myself to it. So, like, there, there are going to be things that you can not program or plan ahead of time. So be prepared to everything and don't get discouraged if your plans or the experiments won't work. So 
like that's a really important point is that that not everything goes according to plan and um you know that if you're if you're not experiencing any failures it probably means that you're not taking enough risks um you know that failure is part of learning and um, you know so so if you can also expect that there's going to be some unexpected things and expect that there's going to be some failures they won't feel so catastrophic or overwhelming when things don't go exactly according to plan all right so another question came in um about how can you help your family understand what you're doing as a graduate student um, and I think for those of us who are first generation college uh, uh, graduate students, it can feel a little bit like your parents are like, are you still in school? Seriously? Um, you know, or what do you think you need to be? You know, you're all hoity toity. So what uh, ha has that any experience in helping your your family and loved ones understand why you are still in school? Um, hasn't re hasn't really been a, a, a problem too much for me. Um, maybe just a little bit of blissful ignorance, but I, I've, you know, I've, I've asked uh, the people who, um, you know, my family members, do you, you know, do you have an issue with me going back to school? And most of them have been pretty supportive. Um, just sort of sharing the, the vision I have saying this is I'm doing, you know, taking these steps now to, to try to get to here uh, later on, um, try to, you know, educate them as to why, why I'm still in, in, in school now. Um, so I guess I've been pretty, pretty good on that front. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. If I also, I want to give an opportunity um, to have um, or maybe maybe cinnamon can do this, or maybe it's Gia to could just give a plug about the breakout sessions afterwards. Is anybody willing to uh, turn on their video and unmute and talk a little bit about the breakout sessions that we have coming up at two fifteen? I unmuted, but I didn't take my video. I um, Gia, I'm going to let you. Well, we have breakout sessions that start at two fifteen. They're really meant to be kind of informal round table discussions and one there we're going to be offering two at both time slots so the first time slot will start at 2 15 p.m and the second one will start at 2 45 p.m one of the reasons why i turned my camera on because i will be hosting one of those sessions and i wanted to personally invite you we already started to have some conversations here about the advisor advisee relationship we want to go a little bit deeper in 25 minutes about how to get started um, building that relationship with your advisor because it's one of the most critical pieces to graduate student success. It's not the piece to graduate student success because there's lots of pieces, but it's pretty critical. We'll talk just a little bit about the research on that too. So Gia, please, please add. Yes, thank you, Cinnamon. So uh, in addition to Cinnamon's session about- uh, Gia, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Is this better? There you go. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Cinnamon, for your quick introduction. So uh, just to add on that we will also, in addition to Cinnamon session about navigating relationship, we have also invited Kate Gruder from the Center for Career Development doing a very short informal uh, session about um, career preps and you. So these sessions are meant to be a really informal setting that um, if you're the type of person that will be, you know, more comfortable asking questions in a smaller settings, we just kind of, you know, want to use this time to uh, talk to your staff member. These are the perfect chances for you to um, be enrolled in these opportunities, and then you will have the opportunity to either attend one of them or both of them to the best of what you're comfortable with. And then uh, in order to access these um, sessions um, back when you're registering for orientation if you have the clear interest for attending these sessions those links should already be sent to you by email but um, if you have not done so if there's any one specific session that you're uh, really interested in feel free to email me or any of the uh, just for staff and we'll send the link to you right after and yeah if you have any questions just feel free to reach out to me and then i'll also post my email in the chat shortly Thank you both. So there was a question that came in, um, and I don't know if Verena, you have thoughts about it because it looks sounds like it's a um, somebody in the MSW program who was asking about um, that they'll have field education that takes place during normal working hours, 
um, and, and other opportunities are during those hours as well. So what do people recommend doing so that you can work to gain experience while still participating in the academic program? So I um, did respond to him privately, okay. um, but the field work, in case anyone else is listening and is interested as well, um, field work is only 20 hours a week. And I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you will receive information about it. I believe you only need eight hours during nine to five hours um, because your advisor does come to observe you and um, speak with your supervisor. So on that front, I know he spoke about wanting to gain more experience, which is great if you personally want to gain more experience, your experience will happen during your field time. So if for whatever reason you need to work and cannot find a position for that um, within our field, I would not worry about it. Your 20 hours a week will be your experience. So I, I guess just don't be married to that if you need to make money. Um, I just don't want someone to feel like they need to get a job in the field because you will have 20 hours a week and it is an intense experience. Um, so you will be gaining all the experience you need. Great. Good advice. Thank you. All right. Well, we're closing up here on the coming up on the end of our time together. Any last minute things that our panelists wanted to share with our incoming graduate students? Last minute pieces of advice or things that you wish you had known? Questions that you thought you might have been asked and sort of surprised that you didn't get asked? All right. I guess we were comprehensive. Well, thanks everybody for being here. I'm appreciative of all of our participants, um, especially our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and our, also our interpreters and our captionists. I really appreciate you making our uh, session accessible for folks. Um, the recording will be captioned and released on the, on the grad school YouTube channel. So you can look for it there. Um, and then if there are other questions that you all have, just know that we're all here for you. Um, so. We call ourselves sort of the place to go when you don't know where to go. Um, and even if you know where to go, we're, we're still here to be helpful then too. So um, get in touch with us. We help students at all different campuses, even though I know that the folks that are not at stores have other resources as well. But feel free to get in touch with us um, through by, by email, by phone call, by Nexus, and um, we'll be happy to see how we can serve. So. Mm -hmm.